Hello and welcome class to Chapter 13, Pediatric and Geriatric Procedures. As you know, with pediatric patients, collecting blood from a ped patient requires great experience and knowledge. Not all pediatric phlebotomies are finger sticks. <clears throat> Healthcare workers must develop the necessary skills to relate phys psychologically with children of various ages and developmental goals. Performing phlebotomies on young patients is technically and emotionally challenged due to a patient's small size, emotions, how they psychic interprets pain and anxiety. Phlebotomists should, be, should start with drawing on older children and working their way down to younger children and infants. Once the phlebotomist has perfected their skills to draw on children, they can then go work with children, which is always a good to understand their fears and concerns that are with all age groups. Once the phlebotomist has perfected their skills to draw on children, when working with children is always good to understand their fears and concerns at all ages. It is also very important to explain what you're doing to the patient, to the parents, so they can get involved with the procedure. Age-specific care considerations providing services that are age-appropriate and considerate. For example, for example, special considerations are needed for different ages of children toddlers versus teens. You wouldn't treat a teenager the same way you would treat a toddler due to their concerns and fears and their emotional challenges that you would come across. For a teen versus a toddler, you can get down to a lower level. Parental involvement during pediatric phlebotomy procedures a parent's support and presence during the procedure is often helpful in deducing stress and anxiety for the patient. On the other hand, some parents are reluctant to get involved, so you, the phlebotomist most times would have to ask another team member or if there is another adult who is more capable to be with the child to get them involved in the procedure in order to calm the anxiety and the fear of the, the child. It is very important to always correctly identify your patient, especially a child who is hospitalized. Most of the time you'll find that their identification is either on their ankle, especially in infants, it's on their ankle, or neonates or newborns. And they won't specifically have a name. They won't have the baby's name. They're most of the time identified by the mom's last name and baby boy or baby girl in the last name and identification number. Children who have had past experiences with blood collection, it is a little easier because they know what to anticipate and what's expected of them. Hopefully it was a good experience for them because if it was a bad experience for them it kind of makes your job a little harder or you have to gain their confidence again in your abilities to draw them so it may take a little more coaching it may take a little more talking to them it may take a little more patience to work with children who have had bad experiences who have had blood collected before always develop a plan to always be successful the first time around. Most children will not give you a second chance to draw them if you miss. So that's why you have to have patience and perseverance when drawing on children. Make sure you have a good viable vein before you stick that needle into that child's arm. Because like I said, you probably most likely will not get another chance. You may and you may not. It just depends on how scared and how upset the child is at the time you do the first procedure, the first time. Always place yourself at a child's eye level so you can see you eye to eye while you're explaining what they're do what you're doing.
if the child has a comfort toy or a whoopee, a baby doll, something, always do it to the baby doll so they can see what is expected of them and what you're planning on doing so they can get some type of visual aspect of what you're doing to them. Always establish some type of guidelines with the child and the parent, especially the parent. Tell, make sure you explain the procedure to the parent as clear and concise as you can. Some parents can get kind of upset because their child is screaming and crying and, you know, getting hysterical. But you have to explain to the parent it's their job to cuddle and to make sure to keep their stress level at a minimum. Don't be afraid to tell the child that it will be painful. It's a needle. It's going to hurt. Never say, oh, it's not going to hurt. No, it's going to hurt. Don't be afraid to say, it's going to hurt for a little while, but I'll do it as quick as I can. The faster we get done, the faster the pain will go away. That's all you simply have to say. <clears throat> Most psychological response to needles are pain. We all associate it, it that way, even adults. And children is 10 times worse than an adult when it comes to needles and pain. Especially if a children that is one to two years old, they might not react as much because they'll be curious more or less until the initial procedure starts and then they feel the pain and it's like oh it hurts and then you get the reaction now for a three or five year old you don't even, you're not even going to stick them yet and you're going to get a reaction because why they're going to say it's painful it's a punishment what did i do i'm not bad why am i getting this and you just have to explain to them it's not because you're bad it's because you're sick and the doctors just want you to feel better we're doing this for you to feel better. So you have to deter it away from saying that, no, I'm punishing you. No, I'm not punishing you. I'm trying to make you feel better. So you have to explain to the child, especially a three and a five year old, that you're not hurting them as being bad. You're hurting them to make them feel better. When a child that's six to 12, it's kind of like they have to go on to their past, uh, past experiences if they're prone to get blood drawn. Like I said, it all depends on if they had a bad experience or a good experience. And hopefully they had always a good experience and you just have to keep that good experience up for them. Keep them distracted. Talk to them. Don't just let dead air. Dead air to a child is like they're being punished. Talk to them, talk to them about they, especially a six to 12 year old, what's their favorite cartoon? What's their favorite sport? What they like to do? What cartoon they like? What they like to do at school? Do you like school? What school do you go to? Anything to keep in mind off of what you're doing. With teens, it's a little harder because they don't like to show fear. They show fear in other ways. They'll show fear with their attitude. They'll show fear with You'll clean, you'll sanitize the spot, and then all of a sudden they'll place their hand on top of it to tell you, no, don't stick me, I'm not ready. So guess what you have to do? You have to have patience and musa and, and start all over again because half of the time you don't clean your spot, they'll put the tourniquet back on, and a box of stick, and they'll stick their hand up there and be like, no, they're ready. And you have a dead needle in a dirty spot all over again that you got to disinfect all over again. Make sure you find the vein because they move, they jump. So the vein may not be in the same spot you found it in the first time. So you just have, with a teen and adult, you just have to have patience and perseverance and just talk to them like they are many adults. Um, not full adults, just many adults. Distraction techniques works awesome, especially with toddlers. Before I even start 
with the equipment or anything else. I don't even touch them yet. I usually give them, I make a, a glove bloom and I draw a little funny face on it just to get them comfortable with me as a person because they don't know me. So get them to be a little less stressful, a little less apprehensive because I am going to touch them. So to get them to get comfortable with me, I do something quirky to get them to loosen up a little bit before I touch them. So I'll usually blow up a what we call a glove balloon and make a happy face on it and give it to the child and I'll be like, well, can I see your arms? And more or less, they'll show me their arms because why well, they got this cute little toy balloon that they didn't have before. Or if they have a baby doll with them, you just say, oh, what a cute baby doll. Can I see your baby? You know, or a little boy. If it's his toy car or his toy truck or his booby, it's like, get them to talk to you to get comfortable before you even touch them, per se. Because you are a stranger to them. They don't know you. So they're not going to be quick on the draw to give you their arm. Um, another distraction, um, if they tell you their favorite song, a cartoon, and if you happen to know, no matter how bad you sing, kids like to hear their favorite song from their favorite cartoon, start bellowing it out. <laughs> it may be embarrassing for you, but it's soothing for the kid. It's soothing for the child. To know that you're willing to sing their favorite song for them, no matter how bad you may sound to them, is the most wonderful thing in the world. Always be mindful of room uh, location. We try not to draw a child in the room they're staying in because their room is their safe haven, their quiet spot, their time for peace and everything. Usually, most hospitals, if we have to draw on a child, we bring them to a treatment room. That's what it's called. A treatment room where we um, actually take the child into another room to draw blood work. Or they'll get a shot, or we don't put do it in the bed. Um, I never really did peds, per se, in the hospital. Um, so, I don't know the full procedures of it. But I'm... Um, from what I've observed during the tours of a pediatric ward, um, they do have treatment rooms where they take the children into a different room other than their room room to do their lab work. Because like I said, their room is considered their safe haven where they can sleep peacefully and play peacefully. And, you know, laugh, giggle, and play. When preparing equipment for a child, um, always be accounted for prep time and preparing the child and the patient for the procedure. Always remember to follow these steps in explaining what you are preparing to do to your child. Always be calm, confident is always the first step in getting the cooperation of both not only the child but the parent themselves. Introduce yourself. Always be warm, friendly, make constant contact, eye contact with the child and the parent at all times. Always show empathy. Show them that you are trustworthy to perform the phlebotomy on their child. Please do not look like you the uh, Jolly Green Giant. Uh, or, or Jolly Green Giant is a giant. giant. But don't be uh, chucky. <laughs> threatening, like, you know, be kind and courteous. Um, never ever always put on, if you have to wear PPE, try to put it on after you greet the child. You come in looking like a spaceman and greeting a child, they, they're going to be like, whoa, what's this? Why do you have all this on? What's going on? What's wrong <laughs> What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? Why are you dressed like this? So always try to put PPE after you greet the patient. 
your own look susceptible to an infection if you're up within a, a close proximity to the person. If you're six feet or more back, far enough back to where they can see you and hear you, but not up close enough to where you can get any type of infection, you're in a safe zone. Always when you're putting your needles together, try to keep it out of sight of the child. You don't want to be putting that needle together and popping it out and everything else right in front of the, ch the child. That's one way to apprehend their fear, accelerate their fear and their anxiety is they see all this that you're pulling out and they're just freaking out because they're like, why are you taking all this out? What is all this? Why is this here? Especially needles. We try to turn up. We turn our back to where the patient can't see us or the child can't see us, but the parent can still see us, say it is a sterile, safe, sanitized equipment that is brand new, that we just took it out just now. We just don't let the child see it. When holding a child for blood work, it's always good to always try to get the parents to help. That way they can have a comfort and someone that they are familiar with and it helps control the anxiety part of the child getting blood work done. Holding a child may in, um, always has to be ensured that other limbs don't come flying at you because it is a pain aspect. What do you do when somebody hurts you? Them arms start flying. The purpose of holding the child is not only to protect yourself because it is a needle, it's also to prevent them from damage or causing harm to themselves. So holding the child is very much required. We do instruct the patients on different types of holds that we do have. Like if they're sitting in a phlebotomy chair and they're small enough, we have the parents sit down and place the child in the parent's lap, put the protective bar on front of them, and they'll do it as a hug rotation, as a hug. They will put the arm we're not using on the side of them, and they will criss the parents will crisscross their legs in front of the kid's legs so they don't kick out. And hopefully the parent is strong enough to hold the legs, because the last thing you want to get is get kicked in the shin by a little foot. The little feet hurt. <laughs> so there are different restraining techniques. Supportive parents, if you give them the proper instructions, they will hold the child. But in case the parent isn't very supportive, you can ask a co-worker if one is available to help you draw the child. There are two preferred methods to restraining a child to immobilize the arm that you want to draw. One is called the vertical position, which works well for toddlers. This requires the child to be held in the parent's lap, which is the one I was just describing. The other one is the horizontal or supine position, especially in an older child. With an older child, we'll lay them down and a healthcare worker will basically lay on the opposite side across their chest and their legs and will hold the arm that we were drawing from flat down on the surface. If a, <clears throat> when in doubt, if you have a, a child who is, you just cannot find a vein, you're not feeling one at all. We can use either ultrasound or infrared light. We have talked about those. Those are the uh, you know, bean finders. Sometimes we use those in class. And what it is is an ultraviolet light that you place on a patient that'll give you a visual of where the vein is. When drawing on needle mates in infants age three months or younger, they usually don't require restraint. You can just swallow them and leave out the arm that you need because they, they move, but 
it's not enough to where you can't handle it yourself. Children who are combative or may become combative by kicking and thrashing and you're using too much excessive force. If that happens and we know that they're running a high risk of injuring not only the child but yourself, your, yourself as well, we won't collect any blood and we'll notify the nurse or the physician that the child become too, became too combative. And most times if when we reschedule the lab, the doctor will prescribe either a sedative for the parents to give, or they'll go by the doctor's office first and get a EMLA put on, which is a topical and a, um, anesthetic. We can't put, we don't have that cream as phlebotomist because it is considered a narcotic. And we as phlebotomists aren't licensed to carry any narcotics. So most of the time it has to be a nurse, a doctor who has to apply the EMLA on, the patient's on. And basically it's a cream or sometimes it's a patch that's covered with a transparent adhesive dressing and it has to stay on at least two to three hours before we can draw the patient and it can last anywhere as long as two to three hours. So one, it has to be applied one to two hours before labs and it can last anywhere up to two to three hours. So that is our window. Most children are not allergic to it, but if they are allergic to it, um, they'll be prescribed the sedative if they're combative. Sometimes you run into this with children who are autistic, severely autistic, not, not, not slightly autistic. If they're severely autistic, um, autistic children, especially those who are severely autistic, they follow a routine. Their day never changes. They do this at this time, this at this time, this at this time, this at this time, and it's the same every day, consistent 365 days a year. It doesn't divert unless they have to go to the doctor's office or they have to get left. That's when the trouble can come into play to where sometimes they can get a little combative because it's out of their norm. It's not something that they do out of the everyday occurrences. When dealing with an infant, we have oral sucrose, which is a sugar um, pacifier, which is 25 percent solution of sucrose prepared by mixing four tablespoons of water with one tablespoon of sugar and you just dip it into the baby's pacifier or you can put it on a, a oral syringe or a dropper or a bottle a nipple and a bottle and space um, what you would do is you would give this nipple two minutes before you would do a heel stick on an infant and its actions usually last about five minutes, which most heel sticks only take about that long to perform. Infants that are given a pacifier or sucrose should be more alert following procedure and they'll be less lessy, fussy, less, less, less fussy, and they will cry for a shorter duration of time. Okay, um, precautions to protect the child. PPE, gowns, gloves, masks are worn as indicated before entering the room. Always remember to remove your PPE according to policy and dispose of it in approximately marked contain, appropriately marked containers like a red biohazard trash can. And remember to always wash or sterilize your hands when leaving an infectious controlled area. As with adults, some children are latex sensitive also. Always look for signs or some kind of bracelet or something to see if the child is latex sensitive. Um, children who are, who are highly latex sensitive are children who have spinal bifida, uh, congenital urinary tract abnormalities, and neurogenic bladder or 
particularly sensitive to latex. <clears throat> Every now and then, we don't have to collect a full tube of blood from a child. We can use microcapillary skin punctures to collect blood that is necessary, where it just takes a minimum value of volume of blood that is needed to do that is needed to run any test that the infant needs or the child itself. And this way it avoids um, the child becoming anemic or being overdrawn. Microcapillary skin punctures, the order of tests collected is a little different than in a venipuncture tube or a evacuated tube. We always collect our hematology specimens first, which is our purple top, and then we go to our chemistries and then any blood bank specimens. When we're doing a skin puncture, heel sticks are more desirable on infants or neonates than a finger stick because their fingers are so tiny and they, they fall up. Babies keep their hand in a fist. And it's kind of hard to get a finger to come out of that tight little fist when they're balled up. Um, most babies don't start relaxing their hands until they're older. But when they're neonates or newborns, their their hands stay in a constant fist like they're ready to punch out punch you out. And believe me or not, some of them little hands hurt when they want <laughs> when they fling it. Um Always use the most um, medial or lateral uh, placer surface of the heel, never ever the center of a baby's heel. That's where most of the bone is. And if you hit that bone, it can cause the baby not to be able to walk because this does damage, damage to the foot bone. So here are the preferred sites. Either the medial or lateral side of the baby's foot, never ever the center of the baby's foot. Because like I said, you'll hit that bone and the baby's foot becomes curved in and will, the baby have less chances of walking as they get older. <clears throat> um, can't use earlobes and you definitely don't want to use the curvature of the baby's foot heel to do a heel stick either. Skin punctures for children one and older, um, we use the third or fourth finger of usually the non-dominant hand. And by the time they're one and older, you pretty much can tell if they're going to be right-handed or left-handed. Um, you can't use the thumb. The thumb has a pulse. The index finger is way too sensitive and the pinky is too small of an area to even stick, even in an adult. If your infant has a foot deformity, such as club feet, it may be difficult sometimes to do phlebotomy procedures due to the twist and inward and downward position of a club foot that are associated with poor circulation. So we would prior to performing a heel stick on a patient, on an infant who has foot deformity, we would place a heel warmer on the foot first, on the heel, and then the procedure we need to do. Always prepare and assemble all equipment that is needed before you stick the baby, please. Um, make sure you always remember the first laws of phlebotomy. Introduce yourself to the parent, explain what you're doing, and use appropriate comfort techniques on the baby. Um, make sure you have the right baby. Identify the baby. Is wash and sanitize your hands according to the policy and put on your gloves and if you have to don on a gown or whatever put that on. Um, most of the time we, when it's neonates unless they in the NICU we don't wear PPE and the NICU is the um, neonatal uh, intensive care unit and most of the time we only go in there to collect specimens. We don't actually draw on those babies. The nurses usually do because they're, they're highly sensitive babies. 
are highly at risk babies. Always inspect the selected area and assess if it is properly warmed. If it's a little cold to touch, make sure you warm it up either by your hands or with a warm wet towel or a warming pack if you have one. It just has to be a warm area so that the blood flow can flow faster than if it's a cold area. You know that by doing human hand sticks, if the patient's hands are cold, are you going to get a good blood flow through that hand? Not hardly. Make sure you wipe the heel dry if you're using a warm wet towel before you disinfect it because you don't want alcohol water, you're diluting the blood flow. You're diluting your blood excess. Um, Right. Always position the baby in a supine position with the knees at the open end of the bassinet when doing a heel stick. This, this position allows the foot to hang lower than the torso, which will improve blood flow into the foot area. Um, never place baby on tummy. Um, they really don't want you to place baby on tummy anyway because it's it. So baby is always on their back already. We're just scooting them down further to where we're placing them at the end of the bassinet so we can have, you know, the blood flow go down to their little feeties. When your baby is in the appropriate position, make sure you clean it with a antiseptic swab, allow it to air dry, don't fan it dry, don't wipe it dry, air dry. And don't touch the incision site anymore until you're, it's your blood. Um, remove your tender foot puncture device, remove the safety clip, remove, but don't press the trigger. For the blade to come out, hold the baby's foot firmly but gently to prevent sudden movements because babies hear that click sound. It's not so much, I, well, I guess it's a combination of both. It's a combination of hearing that click and you actually prick them that they might jerk a little because it's a new sound to them. Um, so we want to make sure we have a firm hold on their little foot so they don't run away, so they don't jerk it away. Um, Raise foot above baby's heart level and carefully select a safe incision site. Place the blade site on either the what? The medial or lateral side of the baby's heel. Always ensure that the uh, ends of the device have made a light contact with the skin and then press the button. Once you press the button, make sure you dispose of it in the sharps. And the sharps shouldn't be too far away. Um, where the best net is. Um, once you have done that, use a dry sterile gauze to wipe the area away because you don't want the first drop, you want the second one. And then once you finish, you fill up your capillary, you fill up your PP, your PKU card, anything you need to do while you have that heel stick, you do it with a sufficient amount of volume that you need to do it. Once you have finished collecting, you place a dry gauze, sterile gauze on the hit on the site where you stuck and apply mild pressure to stop the blood from flowing and to prevent any hematomas that may occur. Once you have stopped the blood flow and you kind of taped them off and the blood has stopped flowing. Um, make sure you label your specimen containers and re-verify that the patient is who the patient is and record your date and time and your initials of um, collection. Make sure before you leave that baby that you evaluate that heel again to make sure that it has stopped bleeding and to check the puncture site to make sure it doesn't bleed later. On an infant with a heel stick, it depends on the hospital's procedure. Sometimes they'll say you can put a Band-Aid on a baby um, where the heel stick is. It just all depends on the hospital. I mean, they really can't 
poop on it because they're not moving around so much and they stay swallowed in their blanket. So it all depends on the hospital's procedure on that. Always dispose any used um, skin puncture devices into a sharps container. Always check um, infant's bed for any equipment or trash that may have left, been left behind because that is very disgusting. How would you like somebody to leave that in your baby's bassinet? Uh, paper, gall, old, bloody galls and all that stuff. No. It ain't come in the baby's room like that. Don't leave the baby's room like that. So discard anything that doesn't belong in the baby's bassinet. First of all, you're not even supposed to put your equipment in the baby's bassinet, but circumstances where there's not a trash can needed, we put them, put it in the corner of the bassinet until we're finished and then we throw it all out once we finish. Dispose of any gowns, gloves, if, uh, in a, if you're in, in an isolation room, um, if you're in an isolation room in a biohazard uh, trash can, if you're not in an instant, isolation room you can throw it all in a regular trash can unless it has blood on it then you put it in a biohazard skin puncture blood is less desirable due to the fact that the blood contains capillaries venues areolas um, and tissue fluid along with blood that's all in the blood um, it's an open collection system, so anything can get in it because it is open air is open to room exposure. Um, so it allows for a brief exchange of O2 and CO2 before it's sealed from the air in the container. All right. To perform a blood collection for capillary blood gas analysis, we really don't do that. Um, most of the time, that's a respiratory thing. Um, so basically, they would collect a small um, from a small child or baby for arterial procedure, which are way too dangerous. Um, they would collect it from um, their lateral uh, posterior area of the heel or ball of the finger. But like I said, we don't perform those phlebotomies. Are usually done by respiratory, especially um, blood uh, blood gases. Um, so here we're gonna bypass that because it's pretty much saying the same thing over and over again. The only difference is they use a heparinized uh, capillary tube instead of a regular capillary tube for blood gases. Um. Collection for capillary blood gas test. Uh, as you know, after we collect the capillary, we have to seal it off with the clay, bring it back to the lab for evaluation, uh, make sure we transport it appropriately the way it's supposed to be transported if we collect it, but not collect it ourselves. Um, All right, needle natal, needle natal screening. As we know, neonatal screening is very important for early detection, diagnosis, and treatment of certain genetic, metabolic, and infectious diseases. Blood spot testing for screening is performed before a newborn is 72 hours old. So these types of screenings are done before a child is 72 hours old. Um, always prepare the appropriate um, assim, um, supplies that are needed. Remember to always introduce yourself, explain what you're doing, and make sure you use appropriate comfort, identify the child properly, and fill out all information on the infant screening card, on the PKU card. Of course, we're gonna warm the site appropriately. We're gonna wash our hands, put on our gloves to prevent any contaminants. Please, please, and I say that again, please do not touch the card with hands or gloves on the filter paper at no part of where you're supposed to collect the blood from. 
because now you're contaminating you're contaminating it even if you have gloves on it because it's just supposed to be just a baby and it's got to soak through through four sets of paper Do not allow filter paper to come, come, become, uh, to come in contact with substances such as alcohol, formula, water, powder, antiseptic solution, or lotion. That's why we have to clean the baby's heel off with a disinfectant, not a disinfectant, an antiseptic cleaner. Circles are printed on this filter paper portion of the card. We have to fill those cards all the way up we can't overfill it and we can't underfill it if we're underfill it that parent has to come back and get a new pku done due to the insufficient collection of a pku card if you look at figure 1323 that is a perfect collection circle it's just a little bit overflow but not excessive to where it bleeds over to the next circle Always clean your incision site, allow it to air dry. Do not touch the site once you puncture it. Allow big drops to form on the paper um, and lightly touch the um, blood drop, the blood drop, not the baby's foot, the blood drop onto the fill paper until you get a perfect card like figure 1321. That is a perfect PKU card where it's all in nice little circles. There's no overflow. There is flowing to where one circle is flowing to the next circle. There's no, yes, you're going to have overflow because you have to fill the whole card, but you don't want it to overflow to where it mixes into the other side, the other circle. Um, you have to let your screening card dry for up to four hours before we can pack it and ship it. We cannot just hurry up, take it, send, pack it, ship it, and go. No, it has to dry first <clears throat> before we can pack it and ship it. Once we have collected a PKU, you know the procedure, you always apply, put gauze, apply pressure, stop the heel stick, make sure you check the baby's heel to make sure it has stopped bleeding, um, dispose any and all equipment that you have used. Before leaving, always make sure you recheck the baby's heel that is not bleeding anymore. There again, it depends on the hospital's institution and their rules if they allow you to put a Band-Aid on the baby's heel or not, but you still have to check to make sure it's not excessively bleeding out either. Dispose of any gloves, gowns, in a regular trash can. If they're not in an isolation room, if they're in an isolation room, it goes in a biohazard trash can. Make sure you wash your hands and remove your gloves after you remove your gloves. Complete any and all remaining information that is on the screening card as a follow-up, as a um, re-verify, as to make sure that you have the correct information on this card. And we will sit in the lab for at least 24 hours before we even send it. <clears throat> all right, capillary blood collection. Finger sticks. Finger sticks usually performed for children older than one years old. They may be necessary if the child has damaged veins from repeated venipunctures or if veins covered with bandages or a cast itself. We do not perform a um, finger stick if extremities have um, compromised circulation or edemas or it's infected itself. Um, we do venipunctures on children, of course, when a larger quantity of blood is needed. 
um, when a vein cannot be vis visualized or palpita palpitated, the use of evasive devices such as an infrared light or ultrasound may be used to find a child's vein. <clears throat> We try to use the vein that is in the anacubical fossa or forearm, which are most accessible, especially in a toddler or a child. Other sites can be used for venipuncture, such as um, the dorsal of the foot, the scalp. We don't do scalpels. So, or the um, medial ankle or the medial wrist, if we have to use those areas. And what they mean, the outside of the wrist area, not the inside, the outside of the wrist area and ankle area. And if you look on figure 1327, it shows you all the veins we can draw on a child. As um, indicated with a venipuncture sample, Usually it's routine laboratory tests such as the ESR or said rate, blood cultures, cross matching, coagulation studies, drug and ammonia level. Those need large quantities. We can't do finger sticks on these types of tests. <clears throat> we do not use, of course, like adults, we don't use veins that are near or on an IV arm. We always avoid deep veins that are in a child, um, especially who have hemophilia or any other bleeding disorders. We try not to use those deep veins because it takes them longer to stop bleeding because they're hemophiliac, meaning they're free bleeders. Uh, most of the time, we when we have to do a venipuncture on a child, we use a butterfly or winged infusion kit on a child. We never use an eclipse, hardly ever. We always use a butterfly. Some children who are very sick, who have like cancer or um, Leukemia, sickle cell, they'll have a central venous catheter or CVC. And this is for them to administer medicine. And it's another way we can collect or collect blood from that patient. We do not do those. Nurses usually draw from lines like this and we just transfer into the appropriate tubes we need to transfer to. And then some nurses will do that for you too. And all you have to do is just go get it. Um, make sure you properly identify and label your specimens after collection. Even when a nurse gives it to you or collect it, you double check to make sure. Um, not sure why they talk about uh, heparin or saline lock blood collections because we cannot draw <clears throat> from a saline or um, from a saline or heparin lock, we're not nurses. We can't draw from those veins only. So if you want to read it just for FYI, you can read it for FYI. Same thing with central lines. We can't draw from those. Uh, you can read it for FYI options. Um, just to know for certification, but no, we cannot draw from these either. Um, so this is just to know. All right, geriatric patients. As you know, geriatric patients use 31% of the nationals healthcare services. In 25 years, geriatric population has reached over 20 percent of total U.S. population. Um, geriatrics patients sometimes make it hard for us to collect due to physical conditions such as arthritis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and other debilitating diseases in elderly people, which makes an increase for point-of-care testing by skin puncture um, 
more difficult to obtain than um, more easier to obtain and more difficult than venipuncture. Not as difficult as a venipuncture. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Increased point of care testing in homes, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, and other long-term facilities is highly in demand. There are more and more POCT testing uh, equipment out there now. There's one that can check a patient's uh, hemocrat hemoglobins and hemocrats, they can check their cholesterol level. It's not just your blood sugar anymore. Uh, some physical problems we may come across with the elderly or with geriatric patients. Sometimes they're hard of hearing, so sometimes you have to speak up and speak clear and speak loud, but not loud to where you're screaming at them. Just loud, clear, and precise. Um, they may have failing eyesight. They may not be able to see you as well. So you have to do a lot of touching and explaining. Um, sometimes they have a loss of uh, taste, smell, and feeling. And sometimes you have to deal with those who have memory loss. Now, if they have memory loss, that's when you're gonna have to uh, really rely on that two form identifier. Other physical problems you may come into contact with other, uh, with older patients is, their skin is very thin, so making venipuncture very difficult. Even though you use a butterfly, you may still bruise them unintentionally. It's not that you did anything wrong, it's just that they got thin skin, so you're gonna bruise them a little bit. Um, their muscles become smaller. Sometimes they become atrophied to where you, they can't move their limbs as freely as when they were younger. So they're kind of like fused in one certain angle. So you won't be able to straighten their arm out as much as if you were dealing with a younger person. Um, yeah, with a younger person. Um, patients, older patients are also prone to hypothermia. They stay cold. Uh, sometimes you can walk in a patient's room and it's an inferno in there and you go to touch them and they're ice cold and they have 10 blankets on with a heat blanket and they're still cold to touch they're very hard to draw from because you gotta sit there and constantly like kind of get a warm spot and get that blood flowing somewhere to where you can get a good viable draw um they're also highly sensitive and have high allergic reactions to everything not only that, sometimes you have to encounter emotional problems that are associated with them aging, um, such as they may have lost a career that they did, lost a spouse, lost close friends, relatives don't come to visit them as often or at all. Um, they can form forms of depression. They can go through fits of anger. It's all these factors we have to come into play with. If you do decide to do home health care, blood collection, or as we say, outpatient, always remember to carry extra equipment with you because it's, it's, one, it's very embarrassing to run out of equipment and you're miles away from the hospital to reload. So always make sure you have extra, extra equipment. Always identify your patient in a home health care setting. Make sure you have put them in a special position when you're doing a venipuncture uh, and always use hands as affected, please. Um, always wait for the puncture site to completely stop bleeding because remember, you at this patient's house, there is no nurse that's gonna come behind you or somebody that's gonna check on them. You have to make sure it completely stops bleeding before you even leave that patient's house and make sure you discard everything that belongs in the trash, belongs in the trash, any sharps, belongs in the sharps containers that you should have in your bag, and make sure you label everything before you leave the patient's house and you put it in a biohazardous bag. Check to make sure you have the appropriate temperature for transporting blood from an outpatient service. Always use uh, security precautions and document any delayed um, specimens that may be arrived. This concludes chapter 13 lecture. If you have any questions or you need me to clear up anything that was in lecture or that you saw in PowerPoint, 
please feel free to text or message me from the middle or if you have my phone number, message me there. I hope you enjoy this lecture and have a nice day. Bye-bye.